This is the Beyond Belief Sobriety Podcast, where we examine topics of interest to people who seek a secular path to recovery from addictions of all kinds. On March 14th of this year, 2021, Roger C. from AA Agnostica posted a story written by Stephanie S., along with a song that she wrote entitled Until You Try. Roger loved the song and recommended that I have Stephanie on the podcast to share her story and how she came to write this beautiful song. It's my pleasure to have her here today. Stephanie, it's so nice to have you. Welcome to Beyond Belief Sobriety. Thank you for inviting me on this podcast. Oh, it's great to have you uh, and welcome. As I said, you know, um, yeah, your song, your song was very moving. It, it, there was something about um, the what what you wrote that I could relate to so well, and I think anybody who who struggles with addiction can relate to it so well. I wonder before we really start getting going, Stephanie, if you can talk a little bit about what inspired you to do that. Do, do you normally write poetry and, and music? Yes, I do. I've been doing that for a while. I mean, I've done poetry intermittently for a longer period of time. I think in the past five years, I had started to try to uh, return to the piano, which I played you know, a long, long time ago. And I found that I just couldn't progress, but my piano teacher kind of gave up and said, you know, Stephanie, just kind of do your own thing with it. So I started kind of composing songs and I find it very helpful. Usually if I'm in a place where I'm struggling, that's usually a time when I write or compose. It just comes more easily to something, you know, it's, it's helpful, kind of cathartic in a way. You don't have a big audience though. I do the same. I'm not not near as talented. I and I, I can't write poetry. I can't write music or sing. But I have a scrambled I brain. <laughs> I have a scrambled brain, and sometimes the only way the only way I can figure out what's going on with me is to write. It helps me organize my thoughts and kind of put things into perspective and understand where I'm coming from. So, and I've been doing that all my life. I mean, from I think from the moment I could write, I, I would write as a way to understand what the hell's going on with me. You know, uh, why do I feel this way? And it's always been helpful. It's always been something. I fall back on in life. So I, I, I definitely relate to that. So why don't we, if you don't mind, begin with playing that song, because the song tells your story in, in a way, probably, I would think. And uh, we'll just go from there. Day after 
yesterday such a high price to pay sometimes you try yeah you try you really try to start a new it's hard to say goodbye when when it does what nothing else can will power always starts to last but it's just so relentless it leaves you bruised and senseless what will it take to raise the flag day after day it's not going away until you try yeah you try you really try and start a Yeah, you try, you really try and start anew. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm glad that we played that and thank you for allowing me to. It would have been easy, I guess, just to um, <clears throat> not have played it and spliced it in later, but it's a good way to kind of set set the set the stage and set set the mood, I think. Something about that song, um, and your son did a wonderful job with it. Um, well, what's his name? His name is David. David. David did a great job with that. Uh, what, a, what a talented guy he is. Thank you. That whole, um, I, I think that we all reach a point in our addiction where we, we, f- we feel there's something wrong, we want to change, and for whatever reason we can't and it's a miracle and i say that as an atheist but it's a miracle that we ever get to the point where we do finally do what we need to do to change so why don't you if you don't mind stephanie just uh jump in there and share your story of recovery and we'll just let a um, conversation flow from that okay well as you know i was listening to the song again and um even more aware that the verses were really kind of in chronological order of my journey. And when I think of it, I always think of this uh, line from uh, this Grateful Dead song, you know, what a long, strange trip it's been. Though I might add a few other adjectives, but uh, I guess it was such a very insidious process for me. I, I had a, um, a before and after event in my life in my late 30s, a very traumatic event, which I struggled with uh, a lot of grief. And since, you know, I think I was always an anxious kind of introverted person, always liked to drink, but always socially, maybe I overdid it a bit in high school, college, you know, it, other time intermittently but but basically you know it was a want not a need and that that's how I've come to define addiction for me is crossing that line from want to need so you know after this experience I struggled a lot I I struggled a lot with anxiety with just a general dis-ease you know uh general difficulty having peace of mind and a lot of anxiety I uh, started seeing a therapist uh, and I guess you know in my early 40s I was at a point where I was working I would come home I would you know have to kind of you know though I'd say you know my family life fortunately was really good but it still felt like a struggle walking through the door having to kind of feel upbeat and make dinner. For some reason, dinner was one of my most arduous tasks at that (laughs) time. And I discovered, much to my delight, that if I poured some wine into a coffee mug while I was making dinner, it was just so much easier. And so that over, you know, I don't remember exactly, but, you know, it was slowly over years that it became you know, something I did religiously, and I also started relying on it more, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, pre-gaming, if I was going somewhere and wasn't thrilled about who I was going to be with or anxious about it, or if I was bored, or maybe if I didn't want to do something else, I, I would drink, because at that point, it was more like a stimulant for me, and I would say, starting in my late 40s, you know, I was talking to my therapist and my husband. I would say, honestly, 
which, and a lot of people have a hard time really believing this, but they were the only two people who knew that this was a struggle for me. And at first, you know, I think I did what a lot of people do. I tried to cut down. I tried to drink only beer because that was not something I enjoyed that much. I tried to drink only on weekends. I tried to measure out the quantity and, you know, that didn't work. I, uh, after a lot of kind of coaxing and not knowing what to do, and at a point where I definitely realized, you know, though my, um, you know, I, I kind of am a good example of how quantity has nothing at all to do, nothing at all to do with addiction. I, I was, um, it had me at, you know, I felt like in a stranglehold, like I was holding on to a, you know, a, a defective life raft, which I knew I was going to go down with, but wasn't going to let go of until I found a substitute. Uh, and I was um, very um, reluctant to get help. I, I felt a lot of shame about it. Uh, and I finally uh, went on to a, um, I took part in an online recovery, like day program, something that was way before this whole Zoom situation it had nothing to do with that. And I, I was fortunate in having a wonderful counselor there, really clicked with her. And over time, I mean, she was very patient because I certainly didn't, as you can hear in this song, get it right away. <laughs> uh, and she, I think along with my therapist, also very patient, kept encouraging me to just try AA. It was very hard for me to do for a number of reasons. I mean... Just walking into a room with people I don't know made me very anxious. You know, I don't know. I felt like uh, I, I would find it hard to, to somehow relate to the people there. I'm a physician, and I was terrified that I would see a patient of mine there or a colleague. And I started going to meetings very, you know, cautiously dipping one toe in, traveling an hour away from where I lived and worked. Do you know that there are meetings for physicians? Specifically for physicians? Yeah, yeah, you know, there aren't that many. And a part of me, around where I am at least, but also, you know, part of me felt that's just not going to be so helpful. Like I enjoyed the mix of people and variety. And I felt like I'm really, you know, like no different. I feel <laughs> like um, my, my struggles are the same. And I'm sure there are people in other fields who have similar, you know, maybe someone will see a student or what have you. Um, so I didn't necessarily want to do that, but. But I can understand. I can understand that. Um, you know, we all have this, the, and you're right. All of us have some reason, something that makes it difficult for us to go into that room. Um, for me, I was never, I never joined anything. <laughs> I never was, I didn't join groups. I didn't do that. And I, I never, um, I, I was pretty young and I, I never, I didn't have any experience with, um, um, dealing with problems, you know, because I, I learned to drink to deal with, to, to avoid problems. So, um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a weird thing, but anyway, I've interrupted you. So you, you went to this, you went to, you went to AA and. Yeah. And I should say, I was also, you know, very concerned about meeting anybody I knew. Oh, yeah. 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 There, there is a lot of shame attached to it. I, I, um, when I went to that first meeting, the first time I heard someone say, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic, mm -hmm. it was like they just slapped my face. It was like, because I, I hated that word. And yeah. if it was ever applied to me, I would get immediately angry. And when someone said that, it was like, I don't know, it was just, it just hit me like, like really, really hard. And um, it shocked me, I guess it was, it shocked me that someone would say that. And now I'm just so used to used to it, and I and I've been I've been going to these meetings now for like 32 years, and I have to be careful. Like if I'm at work and I'm in a business meeting, and you're going around introducing yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I've had I, that happen too. So, yeah, like it's my last name. You know. Yeah, I'm John, and I'm oh, I'm sorry, I'm at work. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I've had that happen too. Um, I was also immensely put off by that insistence on introduction stepping alcoholic like this is my identity and somehow I found it you know almost like you know was part of this humbling uh sense of AA and look I, I have to say I love many things about AA and sure. that's why it stuck with it but 
it's like, you know, remind yourself you're an alcoholic. And unfortunately, it is a word that's associated with a lot of, you know, negative associations. So, but I, too, got to, I just say it automatically. Yeah. I do a lot of things there automatically. You know, it's like I take what works and leave what doesn't. But I'm learning, though, now to use some different language. I am. Um... And I'm, it takes some it takes some practice for me, but uh, I'm starting to introduce myself as a person in recovery or person in long term recovery because that really more accurately uh, mm-hmm. describes what I am today. You know, if if I say I'm an alcoholic, it sounds it sounds like I'm the guy out in the gutter right. drinking still. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and I'm not, exactly. I'm a person in recovery. You know, so um, but anyway, it's 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 there. This is just words, but they do kind of matter. Yeah, it's part of you know. I'm not there. Are many other things I. Sure. Get more riled up. Sure. <laughs> but um, so where was I? So I finally basically, uh, you know, started to overcome that. It was just too out of the way. I wanted to start going to more meetings. And I started to find some in my area. It took me a while to find one that I really clicked with. And it was also so convenient. It was on my way to work. It was in the morning. And it was just... Um, uh, it was small, which I liked, and just a mix of kind of colorful, quirky people from all different, you know, backgrounds and educations and ages, which I really, you know, it's, it's rare to be in situations where you, where you see you're with a bunch of different ages, I find. So I stayed with that. That's my home group, and that's my primary meeting that I've gone to. I miss the face-to-face uh meetings but and and I found a sponsor after two that I didn't click with that that's wonderful and been wonderful uh this is not an atheist uh, or agnostic meeting I am I started out being very tentative about sharing that but now I have no problem and in fact I I kind of like to interject it not not in a oppositional way but because I, I feel a need to express my, my views. You know, it helps me make more out of the program. And I would say, you know, for the most part, everyone is, is tolerant, you know, of that. I say maybe there's one other, one or two other people who feel that way. I'm not sure. I could go into a few things that I had difficulty with about mm-hmm. staying with the program mm-hmm. or... I mean, I, I, I think that we all probably have experienced similar things. I, uh, for me, it was over a long period of time. So, um, you know, I, I came into the program uh, um, shortly after my 26th birthday, and I um, didn't have any kind of religious background at all. I never grew up going to church. I knew not, hardly anything about religion. And when I saw all the God stuff in AA, it immediately made me uncomfortable because I thought that this is one other one more place where I'm not going to fit in because I'm not I'm not I don't get it but I also kind of I also grew up as an as an army brat and I I have within me this ability to um kind of blend in to whatever the culture is that I'm 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 being I'm being introduced to and that's what I did in AA I just kind of became what I thought they would want me to be and that's how I I I was for a long time then after 25 years <laughs> of doing this, I uh, I realized I was an atheist, and I and I started um, and I started feeling more uncomfortable because I felt like I was holding back how I how I really experienced the program. And when I did begin to express myself, I I did get some um, negative um, response from my group. But I think the reason that I did is because for 25 years, I was singing a different tune (laughs) (laughs) and they thought, what is wrong with this guy? (laughs) But I couldn't go back because I I realized that um, I was just conforming and I couldn't conform anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm too old to conform. I think when I was younger, it was a lot easier. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, true. and it's hard to connect authentically with something. It is. It is. Finding. You want to be honest. You yeah. have to be honest. That's what it's a program of honesty. And mm-hmm. if you can't honestly um, relate about how you're experiencing this and how you understand all of this, it just makes it just makes it all the more difficult. So it's good yeah, that I you agree. could be open about it. Yeah, I agree. So, well, maybe I should start with the positives. Okay. You know, which is that. Despite all this, the, 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 the things I, I found uh, difficult about it, I, there was something that made me stay with it and draw me to it. And I think a lot of that had to do with 
this special kind of like warmth that was there among people and a feeling of automatically, uh, you know, a being kind of taken in and uh, supported and just just a warmth that I hadn't. I probably hugged more people <laughs> at any meeting than I have, you know, my family. Right. Uh, and uh, it just felt good. And it also, you know, even there, if there were speakers that I had, it took me a while to uh, compare and not contrast. And But when I was able to kind of just kind of like dive below the surface and see the commonality and, and see actual transformations, which I've never seen before in people it was you know just really an like an awesome thing to see and i also found uh and still find you know some of these slogans and the the steps when again i could dive down and find a way to make it uh work for me to be very helpful so that that kept me in the religious you know what when it states this is not a religious program and it's just completely, you know, speckled throughout with God and higher power, had trouble with that. I had uh, trouble also with a certain, um, like, like intransigence among people in terms of getting that if I said I wasn't a higher power, I mean, that I didn't believe in a higher power, that I never thought I also was the higher power. There's some kind of right, right, thing right, there. Right, with, right, as right. soon as I say, you know, I'm not, a, I always have to say now, I don't believe in a higher power, but I certainly don't think I'm it, you know, uh, because there's always, it seems to be that assumption. So do you overcome those obstacles by just being honest and then um, eventually finding some, some people though, that, that would accept you and support you for whatever, however you absolutely. view things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had some people say, you know, uh, you know, appreciate hearing your point of view. Um, I've also found after meetings you know, it took me a while to, you know, I would, people would come and very well-intentioned telling me, you know, yeah, I could use uh, a doorknob, I could use whatever I want, the man upstairs or whatever, but that didn't resonate with me. And also, I remember being told, read the chapter on agnostics. I was very, uh, you know, naive. At the, I was oh, so excited to go home and, wow, there's actually a chapter oh, on no. that. Yeah. You know, only to <laughs> find it was so invalidating. Yeah, it's funny. I, I uh, experienced the same disappointment, um, actually, with the book altogether. When, so I, I, when I get there, I'm thinking, I find out they have a book. I said, oh, God, I can't wait to get that book. I need that book. Because if, <laughs> if I just get that book, I can figure this thing out. And then it was like, oh, man, this, at that time, it was like 50 years old. I thought, this is really an old book. <laughs> it's like 85 years old now. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah, and that was another thing. You know, I would hear, like, I remember... I was at a step meeting and it just so happened I was reading the second paragraph of step two and I, you know, I almost choked on, you know, <laughs> the belligerent, the savage. And I, even though I am, again, pretty introvert, I had to say, like, this is, say something. And afterwards, you know, some people came out and said, you know, this don't, this is, you're taking it too seriously. This was written right. by three Christian men, you know, years ago. And, right. you know, I'm thinking of the Constitution, you know, we, we, it would only be male landowners right now. Right. Change, you know? So I didn't, that didn't, was hard to accept. But again, uh, overall, I have found meetings in particular, my home group, that they're very tolerant. They yeah. kind of know me and, yeah. um, the people uh, that that's the one that's the one strong suit of um, AA is that, that I, I think is really hard to replicate. It's sort of like a, it's sort of, it's a, it's a culture. It's, it's a culture and it's a very, um, inclusive, you know, that we might not be perfect at it, but we're pretty inclusive that, that you immediately have this connection with other people who support you in your desire to stay sober. And, you know, I would make friends with people that I would see outside of the meetings and do things with. And it just completely changed my life. My drinking was a very lonely experience. And so I went from that being alone in my problems to having people in my life that were part of a solution to my problems. And it was just night and day. And I think, I think it is difficult to replicate that, you know, like smart recovery has some great meetings, everything, everything's online now, of course. Um, but they have a really difficult time 
and maybe not even trying to do, but um, having that um, fellowship type um, of uh, feeling. I agree. And I did try that too. I tried a few um, alternative things. And, you know, I think uh, smart recovery has a lot of smart uh, strategies, but it, it wasn't enough. There was this, for me, it was really, if there was anything close to a higher power, it was the connection that I felt with other people. And that's still the case. Um, you know, another thing that evolved that complicated things for me was that once I went, started AA, I told my children really weren't aware either. You know, I would drink, but never to a point of falling on my face. But again, couldn't go a day without it. So I, I shared it with them. I shared it with close friends who, in a way, unfortunately, I, I it, well, I kind of had a certain persona and fell into relationships where I would listen more than share. Uh, so, you know, I shared with them and everyone was very supportive. But then when I couldn't stay sober for any period of time, I also felt I couldn't drink in front of anybody. And so then came the lying and hiding. And I did a lot of that. I did a lot of um, hiding the alcohol. Uh, yeah, a lot of that. And then the drinking became, you know, rushed. You know, drinking right out of the bottle, not mm -hmm. not even in a coffee cup. Right. Taking, taking little bottles with me in my, you know, those little bottles I discovered were so convenient. I could go take them anywhere. And, and it felt, at that point, I felt like... Um, I was, I was two people at that point, two minds and two people, and it was very crazy making. That's kind of in that song where I said, you know, I wake up feeling one way, and by the night, I act differently. Very crazy making, uh, like two brains. I was doing things that I, I felt I never did before in terms of the um, hiding and lying, and in a weird way, there was a certain dopamine rush from that, too. I would go on treasure hunts in my home and manage to find things. And it was like, wow, yeah, uh, in the moment when I was in that mindset. So uh, that complicated things. It was like another problem. I mean, eventually, I never left AA. I've been in the program about close to seven years. I never left it, but it certainly took me many years before it clicked, you know, many years before I, I was very clear that I cannot have one drink and not quickly get into that quicksand of, um, of obsessing and, and fighting it and just, you know, going to go right to a daily thing. And it took up so much time in my head. You know, I couldn't do other things, think about other things. And, and it was also be becoming, you know, where I had coping skills before the drinking that was became the only one, whether I was bored, tired, happy, you know, whatever it was, uh, uh, that was the go-to. And, you know, there was a process from, you know, not just drinking at, at uh, when I was making dinner, but I would get a jump start before I entered the house. I would get a jump start, you know, uh, before leaving my office, driving home with it in a Snapple bottle. You know, it was just very much in the wrong direction. And you do begin to recover those those um those life skills the positive life skills that dr that drinking kind of takes away um if i ever had them i don't know <laughs> if, I, if i've ever had any of these life skills in the first place i don't know but um i i acquired them at least um as as i got sober you know just just basic basic stuff like how to ask for help how to know that i need help how to be honest and have a relationship with somebody you know all these just basic things that um, I avoided learning because of, um, because I had alcohol that took care of any, anything for me. I think that's been a big part of my recovery, I guess, is learning these things. Um, and a part of that came from the steps. Part of it came from just, uh, talking with people, you know, friendships, people in recovery. Is that pretty much how you've been experiencing it? Absolutely. I mean, there's been a lot of positives. There are times when I feel yeah, I know people say this, and maybe it sounds corny, but I do feel grateful for uh, that certain, you know, I don't think I would have learned certain things about myself. I think it's very helpful to feel humbled, you know, at times. It's, and um, it's allowed me to get much more comfortable 
being closer to people because I've, I'm just more, I've gotten, um, uh, you know, a lot of the shame that I had is gone. And, you know, so you don't, someone doesn't really know me unless they know all parts of me. Um, you know, of course, I'm talking about close people. <laughs> but, uh, and I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I find some of these steps, you know, and leaving a meeting with um, starting the day, um, having something to think about, something I want to work on, something I want to move from the um, back of my brain to the forefronts where I could really be aware of it enough to try to behave differently or respond differently uh, has been great. And just, again, that connection with people. And I think any time you go through a struggle, you come through the other end, knowing a lot more and I think feeling stronger. And, you know, another thing just that relates to some degree, again, to what I do is not only empathizing, but getting it when someone has a struggle that they're sharing with me. Uh, and that's been really helpful it, it, to really get it, what they're talking about going through. But, yeah, for me, it's been... Um, and, and, and being on the other side of it in recovery, it's made me um, really not take for granted one moment of the peace of mind I feel now and the space and room I have in my head to do other things, think about other things. And it's just such a liberating, freeing, freeing feeling. Yeah, it, it it really is, and I'm glad I'm I'm glad that you're experiencing that. I I uh, I have too, and and still do. It's um, I was talking to a friend just the other day, and the w- one thing that I like about the one one thing that I have found true for me ever since I've gotten sober and been an AA and doing whatever I need to do um, of my recovery is that it's it's been a non-ending process. It's just it's really just been it's been um it's been a process where I've just continually changing and growing over time. And maybe I would do that anyway, but it feels like I have more of a roadmap, I guess, to do that. And it's something that I'm more focused on. You know, I think about normal people like my wife who doesn't seem to need anything like that. You know, she just, she just naturally um, learns from life and, and learns how to, how to do things and handle things well. Um, but I needed, I need, um, I needed some, some structure, I guess, some, some path to follow. And I've got that and I, and I, and I still rely on it all these years. Um, but it's, it's gotten to be sort of second nature by now. Um, all of the, everything that I've learned over the years has just kind of become part of me. Um, and the podcast too, just speaking with people like you, um, the, what you bring to me um, kind of always stays with me. The song is going to stay with me. Your story is going to stay with me. All these stories that I've heard over the last five years that with people I've talked to um, are still part of me. And I always learn something from it. Um, and people will listen to this podcast, Stephanie too. And the, it will, it will touch them and help them in ways that neither of us could ever really understand or appreciate the song in particular, uh, music and poetry, art has a way of touching people that um, you can't really get from just you know a conversation. Sometimes, and it's hard for me to even describe if there is, if there is anything to spirituality. And I I don't like to use, I don't deal with spirituality or spiritual language. But if there's anything, if I had to put um, describe spirituality, it would be how art speaks to me. How, why is it if I go to a museum and, I, and I'm looking at a beautiful painting that it moves me emotionally? Or if I listen to a song or if I read a poem, you know, um, how, it, it touches me in a, in a, in a way that um, is impossible any other way. And it's, 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 and it's a way where you're not even thinking about it. It just kind of happens. So um, again, I'm, I'm not, I, I just say, well, that's emotions, <laughs> but, but I can call, I call it spirituality too. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to say, I, I I find too, as someone who doesn't easily cry, I would say the the what makes me most accessible because sometimes I want it to come out. I feel like internally I could be crying, but it's not coming out. And it's music, if anything, it's listening to music that brings it out. And sometimes, you know, poetry too. And yeah, that's one of the things I I love about music. It's it's um. It's just one of the greatest, it is. you know, uh, rich, you know, makes life so much richer. And it's, as you say, it's hard to put it into words maybe, but it 
definitely you know hits you in the gut it definitely you know. does and I'll, I'll sometimes spend an afternoon on youtube just listening to um music just to whatever mood i happen to be in you know uh, it, it's great now to have access to like anything i want to any kind of music i want to listen to nowadays it's, it's right there at my fingertips absolutely yeah that is so great well, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this, uh, this with us um, and, and the audience uh, that people that will be listening to this. Um, I think that um, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting when people start um, downloading this podcast episode and they hear that song and I'll share with you what, what kind of feedback we get, but it's obviously going to touch people, you know? Um, so um, thank you for doing that. It's a, it makes, makes a big difference. Kind of you to, to say, and I'm, I'm- if it, if it is helpful, that's wonderful. And um, thank you so much for having me on. That's another episode of Beyond Belief Sobriety. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to support our podcast with recurring monthly contributions, head on over to patreon.com slash beyond belief sobriety or become a member of our YouTube channel. If you'd like to make a one-time contribution, then visit our website beyond belief sobriety.com and click on the donate button. I do appreciate your support. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back again real soon with another episode of Beyond Belief Sobriety.